Okay, it's running now. Take two. <laughs> so I'll start that over again. Tonight's message is inspired by a video message that I watched recently by Alan Parr. And he's talking about seven things the church needs to quit arguing about. Um, it's well worth watching. So if you get, get a chance, it's called The Beat. Watch it. Um, he'll give you both sides of, of each one of these seven arguments. He'll give you both sides. Oftentimes there's three sides, and then he'll give you his take, what he believes in it. Like I say, I don't agree with everything that that he believes, but he's not that far off from me. And uh, the, his overall premise, the things that we need to stop arguing about, I am right there with him on that one. Amen to that. Uh, <clears throat> and so this is this is a little this heavily is inspired by that, but uh, we'll talk about that. I'm gonna start okay um i'm going to turn to titus now when i give you these bible verses you might want to if you got a note pen write them down i'm going to take just a little bit out of this it's well worth reading these in complete context to get the gist of what's going on in some of these and in some cases read the whole book <laughs> and it's it's right on with this but we're going to go to titus uh, chapter three i'm going to start with verse eight as soon as i get over there the saying is trustworthy and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once, then twice, have nothing more to do with him knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. Now, out of context, you could really go off on the deep end with something like that, but the thing that jumps out at me that I, that I will get a point is avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law because they're unprofitable. In other words, it's, it's, they're silly. It's silly to get wrapped up in that, okay? Next verse is going to be out of Timothy, and he tells him almost the same thing. This is Timothy chapter 1, and I'm going to start with verse 3. Almost started with book 3, or chapter 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, oh no, I did do that wrong, didn't I? First Timothy 3 1. I transpose that. <laughs> Whoopsie. So we're going to start with verse 1 of chapter 3. The saying is trustworthy if anyone. You know what? That isn't right either. Okay, we'll just skip that one. <laughs> That's the Holy Spirit's signal to just move on. <laughs> but he says almost the same thing to Timothy and instructions to him. Um, talking about silly arguments over genealogies and trivial, trivial things, not to do that. But in today's society, we have this thing where we just, just feel like we got to point out everybody else's error. And we call them false teachers. And we make YouTube channels devoted to calling people false teachers. And, yet, and I can tell you, just because I've done it a few times just to amuse myself, you can type in anybody's name on YouTube or even Wikipedia, either one, 
any any preacher's name and then after that false teacher oh man and you'll find three or four channels or three or four videos devoted to denouncing anybody anybody at all stop it okay we're a church that's devoted to what? What's what's the one word that we use? Unity. So we're going to run into this because you know what? People think we're out there on the deep end because we believe in unity. <sighs> They're for a one world church. It's not what unity means. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, you know, they, what they're thinking is they're thinking that, you know, we espouse all religions, all beliefs. It's not what unity is. Okay? When, and we all know that, right? Unity is not uniformity. Okay? And it's not necessarily all-inclusive. It's knowing how to get along with people, even though you have differences of opinion, because you know what the real perspective is that you hold in common. That's unity. Being able to come together for one purpose or two purposes or whatever purpose, bonded by the fact that you're brothers and sisters in Jesus. Okay? So there are three things to every argument as far as the church is concerned. Okay? that you could call divisions in the church. One is pretty easy, heresy. Okay. The other is error. And then there is disagreement. Okay. Those are the three things we're going to look at. Heresy is pretty easy if you know God. Now, the way Alan Parr put it, he alluded to something that I've known for quite some time, thanks to my late sister-in-law who worked at a bank and learned how to spot counterfeit money. You know how you spot a counterfeit 20? That they train you if you work at a bank. This is, this is the way they teach you to spot counterfeit money. You learn what? What is it? Right. Right. Those are things to make it easier. But didn't they teach you what a twenty-dollar bill, a real twenty-dollar bill, looks like, so that you know what a real twenty-dollar bill is when you see it? They didn't show you any counterfeit money, did they? They just showed you a real $20 bill and you learned what that real $20 bill looked like, felt like, what, what the distinguishing characteristics of that. This is your $20 bill. Okay. If you don't know what this says, you can be hoodwinked like there's no tomorrow with heresy. A lot of people who are Christians have been hoodwinked by heresy because they didn't know this. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Does that ring a bell with anyone? If you know what's in here, you're not going to be fooled by heresy. You just won't because you'll be able to tell well, that's not right. That's not what the Bible actually says. Okay. Heresy, when we talk about heresy, heresy is misrepresenting, a few things here, misrepresenting who God is. Okay. There are people who will tell you that God was once a man, that he ascended and became a God. They see a lot of head shaking, but they're people you know. Okay? I'm not going to tell you who they are because you don't need to know. But when you hear something like that, know that 
that's not somebody who believes in the same God you do, you do, okay? But there are people who believe that God was not all-powerful or everlasting. That makes it a little hard to believe anything else that's in the Bible, doesn't it? And yet they'll tell you they're Christians. That's one way of being in heresy. Another way is denying the deity of Jesus Christ. And the flip side of that, denying the humanity of Jesus Christ. Those are both types of heresy. Okay? And there, and there are plenty of people who say they're Christians. I'm talking denominations. They'll tell you they're a Christian. They don't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. They don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. They don't believe in virgin birth. They don't believe this. They don't believe that. And so in order to believe what they believe, you pretty much have got to not believe that the Bible is an accurate portrayal of God's word. That's another way to catch heresy. Anyone who will tell you that there are things in the Bible that are just fables that didn't really happen, you probably should stop listening to them very carefully. Okay? There's some way out there things in the Bible that it's, you know, to keep peace with the worldly people, we try not to, to put too much emphasis on, like, the world being created in six days. I don't know. There's you, there's me, there's science, and there's God. Who do I listen to? I think I'm going to go with God every time because I might be wrong. <laughs> okay. After the last two years of COVID-19, I don't trust science any more than I trust a snake oil salesman. Okay. Period. End of story. I also went through college and had to take certain courses. And I really don't trust scientists any more than I could drop kick one. Okay. The big bang theory. There was nothing and it exploded. Yeah, that's science. Okay. <laughs> Duplicate it, why don't you? <laughs> okay. So, heresy is going to go after some really core beliefs, and it's going to be really insidious. It's going to go after the plausible stuff first. No, nobody's ever found, ex found uh, evidence that the exodus ever happened because the Egyptians never talked about it. Okay, if you lost an army to a bunch of people who left your country after they infested you with a bunch of plagues, would you mention that in your histories? <laughs> Probably not. <coughs> the flood. Oh, the flood couldn't have happened. And there's a lot of Bible scholars, and I mean, these guys are Christians, and they're not heretics. But they will try to tell you that the flood was a local event. That's funny, because that's not what the Bible says. Okay? It doesn't say anything close to that. So you got to kind of know what the Bible says, because some of this stuff sounds really convincing especially if they've got an alphabet suit behind their name and you feel like they might, must know what they're talking about. Well, maybe, maybe not, but I do know that God knows what he's talking about and it's in here. And most of it's in really plain language. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to understand if somebody's got to change translations and allude to stuff that you don't even know and yeah, don't even go there, okay? So, that's one, misrepresenting God the Father, 
misrepresenting God the Son. Guess what the third one probably is then? Misrepresenting God the Holy Spirit. Now, understand that I'm not talking about cessationists. Okay? Do we all know what I mean when I say cessationist? No. Cessationist is somebody who believes that the works of the Holy Spirit stopped with the apostles. Do we all know people in denominations who believe that? Yeah, that's a cessationist. Okay, We are charismatics or charismaniacs, depending on who you talk about, where we believe all that stuff has continued on. And then there's a third category, which I just learned about this year that I didn't even know existed, called continuationists. I'd heard the word before, but I thought continuationist was just a fancy way of saying charismatic, but apparently it's not. It's something somewhere in the middle. Okay, I'm not talking about any of those three, actually, when I talk about people misrepresenting the Holy Spirit. There are people who say they're a Christian and they don't believe in the Holy Spirit. They don't believe in a trinity. Okay. So, you know, all that stuff about the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit, I don't know what they do with that, but that would be heresy because they're misrepresenting a facet of God. Okay. The Bible talks about plainly that, that people who are not of the Spirit cannot say that Jesus is God come in the flesh. It's a real fast way to catch a heretic, and I've used it before. People come into my door to tell me about this brand new church or whatever. And the first thing I ask them is what they believe about that statement. Oh, we don't believe in the Trinity. Okay, well, we're done. Okay, and that's the best thing to do with, with the heretic. Okay, what do you do with somebody who you disagree with who's into heresy? Okay, heresy is real easy. If you know your Bible, you know you're dealing with somebody who is peddling heresy. Okay, best thing to do, don't engage. Okay, it's the very best thing you can do. Don't even have a conversation with them because chances are they have prepared for talking to you ahead of time and they have all the answers and you don't because they probably just came to your door. <laughs> okay. You probably weren't thinking about talking to this person. They have been, okay. You're not prepared. Second thing is if you want to engage with them, make sure that God is in on that with you. Pray before you ever open your mouth. Okay? And know the real thing. Don't ever talk to anybody about heresy without quoting God's word. And be able to find it in the Bible. Okay? Okay? It's one thing to tell somebody it's in the Bible somewhere. Well, I've never read that. Prove it. And now you've got no idea where to find it in the Bible. <laughs> okay? Phone apps, they're kind of cool. They'll do word searches for you. Okay? But I would not even bother to talk to somebody who is peddling heresy because there is a spirit behind them Okay. I would pray first and then I'd make sure that nothing came out of my mouth that wasn't from the Bible. And all you got to do is say, well, my Bible says this. And when they start backpedaling, then you can say, oh, I'm sorry. Our conversation is over. I, I, we have nothing in common. There's nothing you and I want to talk about. Okay. Don't have to be mean. Don't have to slam the door in their nose. Okay. Just tell them, I'm sorry, but our conversation is at an end here. You and I don't serve the same God. Okay. So that leaves error and disagreements. Okay. We'll dive into that a little bit. I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 5. 
Ephesians chapter 5. Starting with verse 15. <clears throat> Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with, with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence, for Christ. There's nothing in there talking about being in a disagreement with this person to begin with, but it's still a code of conduct. When you're dealing with error and a disagreement, you're dealing with other Christians. Okay. A heretic, by virtue of their heretic, are not Christians. Someone who's in error or disagrees with you is another Christian most times. Okay? And there is a different code of conduct when you deal with another Christian. The thing about error is how do you know it's error and not just a disagreement? Anybody? Here's your $20 bill. <laughs> Study that thing. But know that in any th case where you think somebody is in error, you might be the one in error. So don't shoot your mouth off. <laughs> okay. Follow the code of conduct. Respect each other in love. Okay? Do not break the code of conduct you are dealing with your brother or sister in Christ. If you can't have a conversation with that person about that subject, number one is it's all relational. If you have no relationship with that person, do not talk about it. Don't do it because it'll devolve into a screaming fit. It'll look like a debate on Fox News. Okay. It's not productive. It's not Christian. And the Bible says don't do that sort of thing. You're dealing with another Christian. Don't do it. Okay. And especially don't do it in public with a bunch of people watching you. <laughs> it's bad witness. Okay, don't get on YouTube and start a channel and denounce them as a false teacher. Don't ever use that term to describe anybody but a heretic who's peddling that stuff. And then be sure you know what you're talking about. And you can go in the Bible and you can find where it tells you about that. Don't be doing, don't be judging people. Okay. If they're in error, they're in error, but it's all relationship based. If you have a relationship with someone where you can speak into their life and they will listen to you, where you can have a con where you can have a, a very intense debate with them over a topic without getting out of the love walk. That's hard to do unless you know that person really, really well, by the way. Okay. You got to know each other really well and you got to know each other's limits. Then you can address something that you think is error that they've got in their life. Until then, no, you can't. Okay. And don't do it because you want to restore them. You don't want to drive them off. And you want to remember they are your brother or your sister in Christ. Okay. And always be open to the fact that they might be right and you might be wrong. <laughs> okay. There is always 
that possibility when you're talking about error in disagreements. Okay, <laughs> you might actually be the one in error, and it might take you 20 years before you realize you are the one in error. <laughs> okay, so don't burn bridges, relationship bridges with people in the meantime. It's unproductive <laughs> and it's bad. Okay. <clears throat> There are a lot of things that we view as error that are just disagreements. Unless you can prove it in the word definitively, your side of the argument, it's not error. If you can see in the Bible how a person can think the way they think, that's different than the way you think, that's a disagreement. Okay? It's not error. It's a disagreement. And that, that's probably the biggest thing that people get wrong is they assume things are in error because that's the way they think. Okay? There's a lot of that in the church, I'm telling you. And the, the, uh, the sad part is, is that you're looking at it wrong. Let me illustrate that. I'm going to jump a bunch of the stuff that in the Bible because I think you guys get the point, but I'm going to take you to a story in the Old Testament in Joshua that I think illustrates this pretty good. I'm going to set this up for you. They're, they're getting ready to take Jericho. They've just had, so they've come out of the wilderness, 40 years in the wilderness, Joshua's been out there. They finally came in God parted the Jordan for him to walk across in dry land. Okay. They just had their manna stop because they ate of the fruit of the land for the first time. So this manna that's been coming out of the heavens for the last 40 years has stopped. And they're eating the fruit of the land. And that's why. And they know that Joshua is the guy. Joshua is the guy who got the mantle of Moses and to go ahead to take over the leadership of the children of Israel. Okay? And they're getting set to take the promised land by force. They've already been told, be strong and courageous. Do not fear. God is with you. Okay? Got this commandment. So, Josh was the guy. And so he's there looking at... Jericho, scouting it out. When Joshua, this is uh, Joshua 5, starting with verse 13, by the way. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. You're the commander of an army, and this guy is just suddenly standing in front of you with a drawn sword. That might take you a little bit by surprise. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? Okay. Because in Joshua's mind, there's only two ways we can go here. Either you're for us or you're for those guys. I want to know because you're in my way. And he said, no. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Are you for us or are you for them? No. Joshua was seeing it from the wrong perspective. The commander of the Lord's army, which depending on, on how you view it, it might have been a, a, an incarnation of Jesus for all we know, or it might have been an archangel, but no. I'm neither for you, nor am I for them. Why? Because I'm the commander of the Lord's army. <laughs> okay? You're either for me, or you're against me. Do you see the difference in perspective? That's the way God wants you to understand your walk in Christianity. It's not my opinion versus your opinion. God would say, no, 
it's my opinion and you either agree with that or you don't agree with that. It's my way of doing things or it's wrong. Okay. So when you are dealing with other Christians and you don't agree about something, know that number one, getting in an argument about it is not going to work out for you. Okay. Okay. I don't care how on the right you are. If you don't do it in love, God's not going to honor that. Okay? You can speak the truth, but you need to speak the truth in love. Yes? If you don't do it in love, don't do it. You're better off not saying anything. You don't want to alienate your sibling in Christ. Because you know why? We know what Jesus said about that. You're grieving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of that person. So there, there might be messed up in their theology a little bit. But they're not a false teacher. Okay? No. And they're not worthy of you reading them their mail in your self-righteous snit, okay? If you can't do it in love, don't do it, period. So what's the difference between error and a disagreement? An error is something that you can plainly read in the Bible and know that it's wrong, okay? Okay. It has nothing to do with salvation. A good example of this, I would say, in my opinion, a good example of this is the Holy Spirit, the works of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, especially prophecy and speaking in tongues. Why? Because I know that the Bible says, don't forbid the speaking of tongues. <laughs> it says to ask that you can prophesy and don't forbid the speaking in tongues, okay? Don't forbid it, plain and simple. Nowhere in the Bible does it say these things ceased. Okay, unless you want to believe that perfection has come. When did that happen and we weren't told about it? Okay. So that's something I could clearly point in the Bible and say, that's error. To think that that stopped, that's, that's plain and simple error. Okay. Now, I have a lot of friends left in the Baptist church who I grew up with, and they definitely did not believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit were for today. And they're still my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I still get along with them to this day. And I still revere them as my brothers and sisters in Christ. I am not going to get into an argument with it about them or about that ever. I will not do it because the relationship I have with them in the Lord is far more important than me being right about something. Okay. And I know that if any of them watch this video, Next week, my name will be on a video with false teacher behind my name. On it. <clears throat> and this is something I probably disagree with Alan Parr about because he would think that was just a, a disagreement, not error. I'm going on a limb because I could show you in the Bible where you have to pretty much suspend your belief in the Bible <laughs> for that little sentence to say that that isn't what the Bible says. I can tell you that's got to be error, okay? And I've, to me, it's not the big bugaboo that people like to make it out. It's just that you're wrong about something, and I can prove it in the Bible. There are other things that aren't so cut and dried. Are the rapture pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, okay? You can't prove any of it in the Bible. You can't. And you can't disprove any of it in the Bible. You can't. 
Why? Because I don't think we're meant to know. Okay? That's the long and the short of that. That would be a disagreement of the word. Okay? I can have my opinion. I can back it up in the Bible. You could have a different opinion, and you could actually back it up in the Bible, too. That's the way that works on that one. That's a disagreement. Is it worth losing fellowship with somebody over? Absolutely not. Okay? I'll tell you another one that people think is a big division in the church, and I see it as a silly argument, and all it is is a disagreement, and that is the thing, the predestination versus free will. Okay? I know where I stand on it. I have lots of friends who are on the other side of that. Okay? I know enough about the Bible to tell you I think that the answer is what the guy told Joshua. No. I think the answer is somewhere in the middle of all that, and we can't grasp it. Okay? I, that's what I honestly believe about that. And to sit and argue about it is fruitless and silly. We both love Jesus. We both believe the word of God. It doesn't really matter in the, in the long and the short of the thing. It's a stupid argument to have with somebody and to lose fellowship with somebody over. And yet, it seems to be the hot topic of the decade <laughs> on YouTube. Okay, I'll tell you another one that is just absolutely dumbfounding to me. It was a big thing in the 80s over which translation of the Bible you should read. And it's trying to make a resurgence. People just won't let this go. And it's like no amount of explaining to people how these things got translated to begin with will shake them off this silly belief that, you know, the, the one that I always laugh about is, we use only the King James because that's what the Lord used. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of translation, translation errors in the King James, by the way. But we know what they are. It's still a very good translation. And you can take all the Bibles, all the translations of the Bible that, I mean, we're talking about the reputable ones, the ones that people stand behind and people like to argue over. All those translations, if you take the translation errors that we know about, That's, in, that's inherent with almost every one of them, some of them. There's very few of them, and none of them are important. None of them take away from the gospel. None of them change the gospel. None of them are of any weight to totally change somebody's whole belief system. Okay, They're silly, silly little translation errors. They don't matter. When they compare the Bible to the Dead Sea Scrolls, everybody know what the Dead Sea Scrolls are? Yeah, they're just now coming out with Bibles that actually are using the Dead Sea Scrolls as a point of reference. Did you know that? They found those things in 1947, and they're just now getting around to coming out with translations that actually use those as some of the texts when they translate the Bible, which is kind of amazing to me. And that's how careful they've been in restoring the Dead Sea Scrolls and comparing them to scriptures. And they found that the error rate, and these are copies of copies of copies of copies that have been copied and then copied again and then copied again and copied again. So they take something all the way out here and compare it to the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's very little mistakes have been, very little changes in translations have been made. In that, that is amazing. That is a miracle. That's what most Bible scholars, why they're Christians, is because when they look at this thing, you can find more error in the works of Homer, the earliest manuscripts to the latest manuscripts. You can find all sorts of translation and uh, copying errors that happen. In the Bible, you find very few of them. And yet, 
golly, go on YouTube. Seven translations you should stay away from. Pointless. Stupid. One of the best things to a smartphone is the fact that you can get a Bible app with any translation you ever wanted to read and 40 more. Okay, If you don't like the translation you're reading, flip to another one, you haven't lost anything. And you're going to find that pretty much all of them agree with each other. Wow, isn't that amazing? There's a, there's a thing that's going around Facebook, and, and I know this went around through City Church a couple of years ago. And we had a discussion about this. That thing is, is so debunked. If you get it again on your phone, don't forward it to anybody. That's all they want you to do. There's this big controversy. They're trying to, to make this conspiracy theory with Zondervan Publishing Company. Because they're the Antichrist. I don't know what, what their point is. <clears throat> but it's all over the NIV and the ESV having taken away from the gospel. The ESV and the NIV has not taken anything away from the gospel. Period, end of story, okay? What it is, is that if you look at the end of Mark and some other, other places, what they did in an effort to be accurate was they took the last part of Mark and they kind of put it as a footnote in the bottom of Mark. And the reason being, and it says it right there when you turn to it, if you look at the fine print, or if you look at the little asterisk, and we all know that when you see an asterisk, you go to the bottom of the page and see what the asterisk is there for. And if you bothered to do that, you would see that they say, the earliest manuscripts do not include these verses. Well, they just did as a footnote. They're all right there. Okay, they didn't take that out of the Bible. It's in there. Okay, they just wanted you to know that there is this thing where the earliest manuscripts didn't include that. And there's an explanation for that that I wish they would have put it in there. And eventually they probably will. And that is the earliest manuscripts for Mark that they have nowadays come from Alexandria, Egypt. And they were, they're old. They are the oldest existing manuscripts. Alexandria was the epicenter of the Gnostic cult. And it infected the early church pretty badly. Okay? And they had an agenda. <laughs> so, sad to say, but that might be why they didn't appear on the earliest manuscripts, was there's a pretty powerful thing in the bottom part of Mark that if you were a Gnostic, you probably wouldn't want out there. And Mark is the oldest gospel. Okay? So, that is more likely than not why they don't appear on that. However, the translations that do contain that were copied from manuscripts, which were copies from manuscripts that were older, than their oldest manuscripts from Alexandria. And it was in there. Okay. So all that to say, if you get that stupid forwarded thing that says Zondervan is taking away from the gospel and it's the ESV and the NIV doing it, drop the thing in the wastebasket. Do not forward it. Okay. It's a stupid argument that needs to go away. Okay, is everybody, that's probably the strongest thing I'm going to say about, about an argument or about a discussion, disagreement, is that thing just needs to go away. It's stupid. Di disagreeing about what translation to use, we got bigger fish to fry. <laughs> Quite frankly, there are other things we need to be doing with our time here on earth. Because like Jesus said, because, you know, that our time is short. And to spend it, that's a, I know that if you read Titus and Timothy, you'll find out that in context, they're probably talking about something really specific. But to me, that screams, 
pointless genealogies, discussions, disputes over dates, okay, and genealogies. That to me describes it in a nutshell, what's going on with some of this stuff. So disagreement, you have a disagreement with somebody, that one isn't even worth bringing up. If you got a disagreement over it, I mean, if you're friends, you can say, well, here's what I think. And they'll say, well, here's what I think. And know that the truth might be somewhere in the middle of all that. Neither one of you may have the answer to that. Okay. Again, it's not worth losing relationship with somebody, breaking relationship with somebody over. It's stupid. Don't do it. So, Heretics, yeah, don't even entertain them. <laughs> but you're going to know very few heretics. I'm just saying, you're not going to run into them on every street corner. You're not even going to run into them on most YouTube videos. Okay, but it, avoid anything where somebody says, my church is the only way to go. And if you don't believe what my church does, then you're a heretic. You're a false teacher. There's a, a few of them out there, by the way. <clears throat> and I'm not even going to name names because I don't want to be guilty of doing the same thing they do. But I mean, I've seen some whacked out stuff. And one, you talk about taking away from the Gospels. They only believe in books that Paul wrote. No kidding, I ran into this. <laughs> I was suckered into it. Started out with a really good teaching, and then he got off onto Paul talking about, if anyone preaches a different gospel than the one I presented, boot him out of your church, or whatever it is he says to do with him. Then he goes on to explain that Peter was one of those people, and John, and all the other apostles, and it's like, okay, so when you decide that you're not going to have, you're not going to teach anything out of Peter, you're not going to teach anything. So the gospel of John was written after the epistles of John. And by the time the epistles were written, I'm guessing he's thinking that John was off into error land. So you can't use the gospel of John. You can't use half the New Testament. <laughs> What on earth are you teaching people? <laughs> okay. There are some whacked out views out there. They're easy to spot if you know your Bible. They're real easy to spot. You don't even have to know your Bible that well in most cases. But the way you deal with it is you always deal with it as a Christian. You deal with it in love. And in what, how the word tells you to deal with something like that. You never, ever assume somebody is not saved. If you know that they're there, if they're in the body, if they're going to a church, they may or may not be saved. That's true. But don't assume that they're not just because they don't, don't go to your church. And don't treat them like they're not just because they don't go to your church. You treat them as if you know they're your brother and sister in Christ. Always, every time. Why? Because the Bible tells us to. Very clearly. All right. So. Any questions? I'm going to stop the video here.